It's a dreary day in the neighborhood. A dreary day in the neighborhood. A dreary day in the neighborhood. Let's go shoot some shots. Could have had a better ending than that if I'd written it, but I was kind of winging it. Ad living, if you will. It is a dreary day. It's heavily overcast in Sydney today. It's raining, but it's not raining too heavily. Uh, I do have a spare t-shirt in my camera bag just in case it does open up and I get soaked to the bone, which has happened before when I've gone out to shoot in the drizzle. No fun. Uh, it's been a while since I've gone on a photo walk, just a walk with a camera, just for the fun of taking shots and seeing what I can get and just playing. Uh, it's kind of meditation for me. It just helps me clear my mind. And I've been pretty stressed the last couple of weeks. No specific reason, just you get in the headspace and you just wig out. And I just needed to go for a walk with a camera and I decided, uh, because it is so overcast today, black and white, low contrast is the way to go. Uh, and I want a fun, interesting, novel lens. So that's what I got. This lens here, it's the size of a a bottle cap from a coke thing or, or any other brand not sponsored by coke it's also the same size as a bottle cap from pepsi uh or, or any of the other smaller drink companies where am i going with this but this lens which is actually slightly smaller than you think it there it's sitting on top of an adapter at the moment it also has a uv filter on the front of it to protect it because it is a relatively rare lens not that easy to come by these days uh, i think it's about as old as i am almost uh, and it's from an old slr system uh film camera called the Pentax Auto 110, one of the most interesting film cameras uh, and, and the most unique SLRs ever made. And it just so happens that that shot on 110 film and 110 film has the sort of surface area, image area, that's about the same as a Micro Four Thirds camera. So the lenses from that, once adapted to Micro Four Thirds cameras, work really, really well. And what I've got on here at the moment is the 24 mil, my favorite of the lenses. So join me on my wonder, we'll take a few shots and we'll have a little chat about this lens and its history and the camera it came from and why it's 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 so much fun even today. Itty bitty! Look at this teeny tiny. I keep a little stash of odd and interesting old manual lenses on lenses I can easily adapt to Micro Four Thirds for just such occasions, just to go for a walk and have a bit of a play outside of the usual, you know, the, the real, the proper, the auto-focusing lenses that I use for actual videos and such. Not that I always use them in autofocus, that would be a newbie move, but point is, lenses like this, old lenses like this, old SLR lenses, manual focus lenses, force you to work slower. They force you to think a bit more about your shot. Uh, and just in that much, they become more interesting. They also have some interesting optical properties from time to time. Sometimes they're wonderfully, gloriously sharp or just kind of soft, or they do weird things to color and contrast, or they have weird uh, artifacts at the, at the edges because they're not being automatically corrected by the camera. And, and there's just so many things to like about funny little old lenses you can slap on cameras like Mark Four Thirds, uh, and to a lesser extent, the Sony mirrorless ones. One of the more interesting things about shooting with these Pentax 110 lenses uh, is none of them have adjustable aperture. 
The aperture was actually controlled on the camera body itself. It had a couple little blades. You wound up with this, with this weird sort of square aperture thing going on. Uh, and there was no way to manually adjust it because the Auto 110 is, as the name might suggest, auto, point, focus, uh, shoot. And because most of the Pentax 110 lenses are so teeny tiny, getting like a variable uh, neutral density filter to fit on the front of them or getting some sort of step up ring is a challenge in itself. So I generally don't even bother because half the fun is dealing with limitations. Uh, so I deal with the limitation of not being able to adjust the aperture, which is one of the reasons why I decided to bring this with me today, being so overcast, you don't really have to worry too much about being overexposed. The other thing I like to do with uh, vintage lenses is, is shoot in black and white, sort of low contrast grainy black and white or very, very high contrast grainy black and white to sort of emulate sort of the grittiness of, of, of analog black and white photography, which is where I learned photography, shooting black and white because black and white's easy to develop uh, when you're a student because the chemicals and, and process is much simpler than color film was in a DIY format. Plus, and I've talked about this before, there's something about shooting in black and white that makes you think about the composition a little bit differently because you're not relying on colors to pull the eye you're looking at tone and contrast and sort of the flow of the image and a black and white image really does change the way you look at something and i enjoy that as well that said i'm not actually shooting with a black and white preview or a black and white filter on the camera itself i'm going to do it in post so i have better control i'm actually shooting in a very flat profile straight out of the camera so we'll see how we deal Now, luckily for me, manual focus on the GH5 here is a joy because there's focus peaking. I don't know how well you can see that in here, but you can see the yellow highlights just dancing across the edges of the cactus pins there. And if I pull it away, you'll see them disappear and they come back again. That's, that's one way. That's not always the best way. It's a nice quick and dirty way. It's very helpful, but I've also got this button set up down here. Uh, if I hit that, it'll bring up the photo shredder cooler and I can sort of move it to where I need it to be, either with the controls or just touch screen. And then I hit the button again, doink, and we get a zoom in so I can just crop in on it and really make sure we're in focus there. So manual focus, not such a challenge uh, on this camera, which is one of the many things I love about the GH5 as a matter of fact. And of course it works in video mode as well, even while you're recording. So. Uh, let me try and get this so you can actually see the screen. So there we go, we are recording, and you can see there's my focus highlights right there. I can't punch in while I'm recording, but this is good enough to help me track moving subjects and such. Not that this is a particularly good example of a moving subject, but in order to shoot and focus on a moving subject, I would need three hands to also film it and show you it. So uh, you get the point, right? So an interesting thing has been happening. Originally, I left the house with the intent of just going for shooting, for shooting's sake. Hello, noisy truck back there. Thank you for ruining my audio. Uh, but as soon as I decided to make a video about it and start talking about this little lens, uh, I, I started to fall into my habit of going to my usual test shot locations, like the statue back there and the cactus gardens and such. So I'm gonna try and break that habit right now.
Now, the nature of these lenses being fixed aperture is an interesting one because they're marked as f2.8, but they're not actually f2.8. They're only f2.8 when used in conduction with the camera they're designed for, the Pentax Auto 110. But because of its inbuilt aperture blades, that brings the lens down to f2.8. When used on a camera like this that does not have those built-in aperture blades, uh, it's estimated to be closer to f2. So we're actually able to get slightly shallower depth of field from this lens on this camera than we were on the camera it was designed for. And of course the nature of 110 film and subsequently uh, micro four thirds cameras uh, and the size of their sensor area, or their film area as it were back in the day, that means we uh, basically double the focal length. So we're dealing with something closer to a nifty 50. Think of it One of the other particular joys of using these old vintage lenses on modern bodies uh, is you get to take advantage of things that you never could take advantage of before back on their proper bodies. And things like, well, in-body stabilization for a start, which is a huge boon to me because I love shooting handheld. I don't really love carrying a tripod anywhere I go. And when I do, it's usually a mini tripod or I've got a specific need in mind, but never on these photo walks. Too much to carry, I want to stay light. Normally I carry one body and one lens. Maybe even two lenses if I'm feeling particularly outrageous that day. Point is, uh, it works brilliantly with the in-body stabilization on this for handheld video and even uh, photos when I need to drag the shutter a little bit. Self-portraiture, a little bit more tricky with this lens. It's not really at a friendly focal length or arm's length stuff. Uh, and even if it was nailing the focus while you're already doing that, or, or indeed doing what I've done now and set up a little mini tripod, uh, if I move far enough away for comfortable framing, I can't reach it to focus it. So I have to reach in and, and try and focus it and then come back and hoping I'm in focus and I'm so far away I can't actually see the focus peaking properly from this distance. I could whip out, you know, the phone and, and, the, and, the, and the app and sort of check the focus on that way, but more trouble than it's worth for what we're trying to do here. So uh, for an average YouTuber lens, maybe not ideal. Minimum focusing distance is, I'm gonna call that about 40 centimeters. You know, the lens marking says 35, but I think with the adapter ring and everything we've got on here, we stretch it out just a little bit. So not super good for the kind of little mini macros that I like to do around these parts here. Sometimes get real close to a flower, or, you know, focus in on a dew drop or something, but close enough to be pretty handy. And of course, we can focus out to infinity with no problems at all, which is sometimes an issue with adapted lenses, being able to focus to infinity with this, these ones, no problem. I'm accidentally turning this into a lens review. Can't help myself, old habits. This video is supposed to be just about 
going out and shooting. Oh well, go with what feels right, I guess. Speaking of which, shooting selfie with a 50 mil equivalent lens, that doesn't feel right. And that feels right. Are you uncomfortable? Are you too close to me? You're too close to me, aren't you? How big's the screen you're watching? A little bamboo grove here in the gardens. I love and hate this. On the one hand, there are some real interesting shots to get with all this sort of depth and textures and stuff. On the other hand, all these dipshits just carving their names into the bamboo. Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I mean, I understand why they do it, but at the same time, it's just hideous and I don't know, you're hurting the plant, but it's bamboo, you can't. I mean, you can try and kill bamboo. You can try. But the main reason I tend to come here is so I can sort of play with bokeh, because I get lots of sun coming through the tops there. And as you can see, the bokeh on this lens, it's kind of typically vintage. Very smooth, but with a little hard edge ring around it. And uh, depending on sort of the mood you're in and the style you're after, that can be a very desirable thing uh, to not have perfectly, perfectly blurry bokeh with just that little, that little ring about it. I quite like it. And as you can see, focusing's nice and smooth as well. But again, I've, I've fallen into lens review territory where I've come to sort of one of my test shot locations that I tend to come to instead of just enjoying myself and shooting. So let me find a shot here and see how we do. There we go. All I had to do was look down. This I kind of like. There's, there's almost a geometry here, almost a natural geometry, except for just, just, just that. There's one outlier there that, that ruins it, or possibly makes it work. Either way, the, the difference in shades here between the, the stumps of the bamboo uh, and, and, the, and the leaf litter and stuff. I think once we pop that to black and white, it's going to be a nice set of textures there. Next thing I'm going to do is get down real low and shoot across them and see what we find. There we are, a few interesting things going on here, kind of almost reminds me of uh, steam stacks from a nuclear power plant or, or silos from a farm. Sorry if the camera should go, I just had to shake away, a shoo away a little, no, shoo, shoo, ah, there's a mosquito after me guys, I'm gonna have to run, I don't want a mosquito to bite me, uh, shoo, ah, mm, nope, got him, did I get him? I don't know if I got him, eh, nope, didn't get him, alright, yeah, I mean, you tell me what you think I was going for on this shot, tell you what, I'm gonna run away from the mosquito, I hate mosquitoes. You tell me what you think I was going for in this shot. <laughs> but there you go. I had fun. I feel very relaxed after that photo walk. What do you reckon? 24mm Pentax Auto 110 lens adapted to Micro Four Thirds. It's one of my favourites. Absolutely one of my favorites. What's your favorite adapted lens? I wonder. Thanks for watching. I am Blunty, and I will catch you next time.